Now time for the chamber and this morning we are looking at initiating uh, an action in court. Now initiating an action against someone or an entity in court um, can be a nightmare for aggrieved persons. Despite the friendly nature of Ghanaian courts, the thought of going through the legal system um, scares majority of people whose rights have been trampled upon. On the chamber today we take you through the process of initiating an action in court. Right, my guest this morning is Kweku Efriye Insia Asari. He's a legal practitioner at Sorry at Law. Good morning, Kweku. Good morning. How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Now, this morning, we're looking at initiating an action in court. This is right. the basics, the fundamentals, how you start a process in court against another person. So, um, should we start off, first of all, by talking about the... the jurisdiction of the courts first of all you have to it has to be the appropriate um forum right to where you take your case to so can we start by looking at the the structure the court structure right basically um the the judiciary as an arm of government um in ghana has been vested with final judicial authority and so um for purposes of adjudication of matters that um, come before the courts the courts properly derive their powers from the constitution <laughs> Now, we know that under Chapter 11 of the Constitution, um, particularly under Article 125, the courts have been vested with judicial powers. And that in the exercise of these judicial powers, um, the Constitution actually says that the courts should not be subject to any other authority. And so the, the authority of the courts to administer justice is uh, not subject to anybody's authority or uh, the authority of any other arm of government. Now, um, within the system that we run in Ghana, which is known as the common law system, um, there are established a hierarchy of courts. Mm -hmm. um, at the very top of it is the Supreme Court, coming down to the Court of Appeal, High Court. And these three constitute what we refer to as the superior course of judicature. Right. Now, um, below these three is what we, we call the lower court, which essentially... What is the difference between the lower courts and the, and the high court? Um... The, the, the difference really um, would um, reside in what powers the courts have and what we call the authority or the jurisdictions. Okay. And so um, the lower courts basically deal with um, everyday matters, I should say. Well, um, what courts are the lower courts made up of? Um, as it's constituted now, we basically have um, the circuit court, the district court and the juvenile court um, constituting the lower court. Okay. And so, so they deal with everyday matters, basically, such as um, everyday matters such as um, tenancy issues, um, petty squabbles, and stuffs like that that come before the courts that should not really um, preoccupy the rather important jurisdiction of the superior court. Right. Does the penalty of the the crime or the offence also? Um, is it also a factor to determine which court you take your case to? Sure, sure. Um, that would take us to discuss what we call jurisdiction. Basically, jurisdictions of the court is, um, in, in ordinary legal parlance, um, what it is that is the authority of the court to adjudicate or to exercise the powers that is conferred on them. And so, um, when you speak of jurisdiction, um, we may have what is... Um, criminal and civil jurisdiction of the court that is in general and then um, we may also have what we call the power of the courts to exercise their um, powers of adjudication mm -hmm. and so the authority that the court derives from the constitution or any act of parliament to exercise its powers is what is called its jurisdiction right. and that gives the courts the ambit um, within which it can exercise that uh, power. Okay. So now let's get into um, instituting an action. What is right. the first step? Well, should we, should we deal with the lower courts or the, the high courts? I think since, I since the lower courts deal with everyday issues, maybe, maybe we should look at the lower courts? Right. Now, um, the Constitution haven't given um, the power to the courts to exercise adjudicatory um, authority. Um, there are further legislations, for instance, the court act that would establish what powers a particular court has to exercise its jurisdiction and the extent to which it can exercise. Now, for that purpose, the court will set out how 
essentially actions would commence before it. Okay. Generally in Ghana there are about three basic ways uh, by which uh, actions could be commenced. Now the first one is by ordinary sermons and we popularly Is that what in local parlance we say uh, samai? Yeah, ma samai no quotes, ma samai no. Precisely. So it's so a writ of summons. Basically. What does yes. that mean? That you've been summoned before a court? An aggrieved party in a civil uh, matter would essentially apply to a court that I'm aggrieved on these particular reasons for which I would require the court assistance in, in remedying and so would then request the court to basically drag the other party against whom you might have a claim to come so that the when court When you say drag, that means the other party does not have a choice. When you are summoned by the court, you have to go. Um, Can you decide not well, to go? Ordinarily, you might say so. But um, under the rules of court, in civil matters, you cannot necessarily compel someone to appear before a court. Once you are summoned, you have an obligation to appear before the court. But that obligation does not go to the extent of you being compelled in that sense. And so, so you may. So are we saying you can refuse? A to party, go? a party might well refuse to to attend court. Well, what happens in that case? The court to go ahead and hear the matter. Okay. So judgment so will be given regardless of whether or not you are appearing in court. Okay. So it, it would be in your interest to attend, but if for any reason a party feels that he doesn't want to attend, then you 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 do so at your own peril. Right. Because then the the the, the, the fact of your liberty not to attend will not constitute to mean that whatever sequel that falls out of it in terms of a judgment coming out of the court will not be binding on you. On you. Once you've been joined in an action as a party, if you choose right, not so to attend... so if you choose not to um, appear in court and judgment is given, you are bound by that judgment? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right, so let's go on then with the, with the writ, when, uh, the writ of summons. What exactly is contained in the writ? Right, but before I do that, um, the other forms of initiating actions before a court could be a, by a petition or by a originating notice um, of motion. And so, apart from... Can you tell us a little from, bit about the two you just mentioned? Yes. Um, particularly in um, divorce proceedings, matrimonial courses, because um, the principles of our legal system would not want it to appear as if um, in dealing with matrimonial courses, the matter is as adversarial as in dealing with ordinary civil courses. Um, you approach it in a more humane manner, and so. But a lot of divorce cases are very adversarial. Well, but <laughs> it may it may well be adversarial, but the system doesn't want, want it to it be to so. Be seen as and such. so the system would want to package the process of dealing with matrimonial causes in a manner that would not um, be akin to an ordinary civil litigation. Right. That would seem and so acrimonious. Precisely, and so instead of initiating a, a matrimonial matrimonial cause by means of a writ and statement of claim which is mainly adversarial um it is our case that we initiate um matrimonial courses by, by petition, petition. Uh, was that the same case with our um election petition no no that is quite apart from that okay. and um if if, if we have enough time, time i go into that, that as well okay. right right and we talked and about, we that spoke origin. about um originating uh, notices of, of motion um under the rules of court there are specific other claims that could come before the court that might not necessarily have to be per a rate of sermons or per um, 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 a petition. Now, um, a typical example could be um, um, an application for interpleader. Um, what is that? If, for instance, a court has delivered judgment for which um, a judgment creditor um, um, requires enforcement, and attaches a property, for instance, in the belief that the property belongs to the judgment debtor. Now there could be the possibility that that property might not belong to the judgment debtor and that a third party might have an interest in it. Um, the right of that third party to establish his interest in such a property which has been attached pursuant to an order of a court um, would have to commence by a court action. But um, and the wisdom of our um, um, judicial system and, 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 and the proceedings therefrom, it may not necessarily have to go through uh, the rather cumbersome process of in initiating it per rate of summons. And so you can, you can um, just simply apply to the court by a simple motion. Are you being alone? I'm sure you know what it is, but for the benefit of the general public, by a simple motion, which is a general application to the court with an attached affidavit deposing to fact giving rise to your claim 
and so that the court can look at it. That is more simple, straightforward. You put your case as simply as it is in a motion, supported detailed with an affidavit, setting out what your claim is, and then the court on that basis would then proceed to make an inquest into the matters. Right. Let's deal with the rates first. Since, um, those are more common. Or even petitions are common. Jan, right. seeing as there's a, a rise in divorce And even motions are common. In this case. But what we know in local parlance a lot is the summons. So right. let, let's deal with a, an example of a summons. If, you, uh, if you're served with a summons, what is the procedure? What is the process? Very but well. first of all, tell us what is contained in the writ itself. Right. Um, what happens is that when a particular person is agreed for which reason he requires the assistance of the court in adjudication, um, he would essentially may want to go in person because the law allows you to actually come before a court in person as in represent yourself or you may want to have the services of a lawyer to do so for you. Now be that as it may, you apply to the court for a rate of summons. Now there are forms prescribed under the rules of law and so you have a rate of summons which should feature specific and particular um, 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 lack of better words, event on the sheet. And so um, the name of the parties involved, you being the complainant in, in simple language, plaintiff in, in legal language would commence the action against an identifiable defendant. Now, if you have the luxury or benefit of it, you have to provide the address of the defendant. If you do not have, there's an option for you to endorse the writ with a statement saying that you should direct service, i.e. that you should lead the court to um, wherever it is that is the address of the defendant. But um, um, quickly, before even getting into the writ, must you not have a, a legal capacity or legal competence to even institute an action? Certainly. Can any action at all be taken to the Certainly. Court? Before then, that, that is premised on the fact that you have a claim. Mm -hmm. And having a proper claim would require that you have the capacity to bring an action. So, for instance, in Ghana, under the rules of court, there are specific uh, people who cannot initiate actions. For Such instance, as? minors. That a child um, may not will the capacity to initiate an action. Uh, Even mentally, if you have legal representation, I was yes. saying, okay, so an, a child cannot bring an action. Basically. Even through a lawyer. No. Okay. So, so because the, you, you should have capacity first to request for the services of a lawyer. Okay, so if a minor has a case, right. what do they do? And so if a minor has a case, then his guardian, Adlet, and his nest of kin would then have to, who, who is supposed to be a major, would then have to institute the action on his behalf, on his behalf and endorse on the rate the fact that he's instituting the action in that capacity. Right. Which other group Much, of persons cannot bring an action? Uh, a mentally disabled person cannot bring an action be before a court. Okay. And the list runs on. Right. right. Okay. And so so having... having satisfied yourself of your or having established your capacity to bring an action you bring this action um, what about the claim the case itself is it any case at all that can be taken to court well any contention that requires factual inquiry would basically suffice to to be initiated can you give us an example court? of certain cases that cannot be taken or can be taken well readily i may not be able to give um, or I would say uh, um, that there isn't a case that cannot go before a court. Once there is a contention and once the court have been given the power to adjudicate an impasse or a dispute between people, once that is established that there is a dispute, then you can, you can take it to court, right. basically. Okay. Yes. So let's carry on with the writs, what's contained right. in the writs. So um, you endorse the writs with your, your, your capacity as a plaintiff, your address, and then... Um, under the writ is endorsed certain things, uh, basically call it instructions to the party. So the writ basically summons the defendant uh, against whom the party initiating the action has a claim to appear before the court. Now when you are served with a writ, on the writ is endorsed the fact that you need to make an appearance before the court within eight days. Okay, um, now, can you give us in very, maybe layman's language, exactly right. what is contained in the writ? What does it say when you receive a writ, when you open it? When you receive it a writ and you open it, it only informs you of the fact that somebody has put forward a claim against you and that the court requires your attendance and responses to the claim in order that it may be uh, it may properly um, set out adjudicating the matter. And, and you mentioned that it's eight, eight days to it gives enter you, appearance. It gives you notice that you have to enter appearance in eight days. What that means is not for you to physically appear before the court. 
but that there is a form by which you also give notice to the court of your formal entry into that contest and the fact that you are ready to, uh, to come uh, basically and battle it out. Battle it out. Okay. Yes. So, um, so what, uh, apart from um, entering appearance, the condition for you to enter appearance, what else is contained in the writ? Um, apart from the condition to enter appearance, um, it is just uh, the, the, now, um, when you receive a writ of summons, by our rules, it normally would come with what we call a statement of claim. And so what we've said so far is what is actually contained in the writ itself. Now, the annexed statement of claim to the writ will basically set out what it is that is the claim of the one initiating the action. Mm -hmm. And so the person will set out the default by describing the parties to the action and the nature of their relationship giving rise to the contest. And then go ahead to establish um, by way of allegation mm -hmm. what it is that is... Um, given rise to the action right and then um, conclude in the statement of claim as it would be endorsed and direct with what it is that is the relief that he seeks you see from, from right. the court so when the defendant now also enters appearance is there anything that they need to also attach in response now, to the statement of now claim? the rule says that within eight days you enter appearance and then within 14 days after the time limited for appearance is which is within 14 days after the eight, eight days, days you would have to set up a defense for yourself now setting up a defense you need to put together a statement of defense which would be um essentially filed in the registry of the court and put on the records of the court as your defense to his statement of claim okay now how do you um how do you send or uh, give somebody a writ um you essentially you would the file the writ mm -hmm. at the registry of the court now the courts have officers who have the duty and responsibility to make sure that once the proper address of the defendant is endorsed on the writ or that once you are readily available to lead them to um, the address of the defendant they have the mandate and you know, or, 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 um, obligation to serve the writ and so if the address is there you may just deposit your writ after filing at the registry and people will call bailiffs will then pick it up trace the address go and serve the defendant and come back to court and endorse on the records of the courts that the defendant has been properly served. What if you don't find the person? You are unable to serve the person. What happens? Right. The, the system has a way of dealing with all these things because sometimes, genuinely, some defendants may not be available. Sometimes you find some recalcitrant defendants who may want to swear the exactly. system and so not make themselves available. Now, the, the rules um, is to the effect that after three consecutive attempts to serve the the defendant. Thankfully enough, the person who ought to serve the defendant is a neutral person who might not know the plaintiff or the defendant. And so he would come and basically relay the information of the frustration in the process of serving to the court on that three consecutive occasions. And then on application by the plaintiff, the court would then grant you the permission to have the written statement of claim served on the defendant by some other means apart from physically handing it over to him. An example would be to, for instance, publish the, a copy of the written statement of claim in the newspapers, posting it at the last known um, abode of the person or on the notices, notice board of the court or any other means um, which the court may direct in its own wisdom. Okay, what if the person is outside the jurisdiction? Now, there are processes for serving writ outside the jurisdiction as well. You may not, under the rule, serve the writ itself outside the jurisdiction, but you may serve notice of the writ, which would essentially contain everything that there is on the written statement of claim. And you would need to basically supply the information to the court, the fact that the defendant or a defendant is not ordinarily resident in Ghana and so may have to be served outside the jurisdiction. Now that would have to come by a way of application as well. So when you apply to the court and the court is satisfied that it's a proper case for you to serve that defendant outside the jurisdiction, it would make an order to that effect and give conditions for the order. Okay. And then you can serve it through courier, sometimes through um, foreign service and order. Okay. By registered mail, basically, so you can by, trace It's it. either by registered mail, you could serve through the Ghana mission abroad, foreign okay. service, any other, uh, I mean, any plausible uh, means which could be ascertained, I mean, especially when it is said and betrayed right. and all that. And um, will that rate compel that defendant to come and face the proceedings? Certainly. Okay. Certainly.
Set all right, quick, this is all the time we have this morning. I know right. we have no way exhausted this issue, so I'm sure we'll bring you back tomorrow or next week to continue right. with this um, topic of initiating court action. Uh, we've been talking to Kweku Efri in Siasa. He's a legal practitioner at Sorry at Law, and he's been taking us through the process of initiating an action in court.